A couple years ago now, I made a video about 3D printing mirrors. I took some pretty typical PLA FDM prints, smoothed the surfaces with a two-part epoxy, and used a chemical silvering process that deposited an extremely thin layer of metallic silver in order to create a first surface reflector, the same sort of mirror that's used in telescope optics. Sometime after that video aired, Steve Mould got in touch and said, hey, you know what a convex mirror looks like, and you know what a concave mirror looks like. Do you think that with your 3D printed mirrors, you could make a saddle point mirror that was simultaneously concave and convex? And I said, you know what? Absolutely, I can do that. And then I got busy, and then it took like a while. So after you watch this video about my efforts to create a saddle point mirror, you need to go watch Steve's video. Steve's... Steve's video. Where he's going to talk about the bizarre images that are formed when you're looking through a saddle point mirror that is simultaneously convex and concave. My original goal when I started 3D printing mirrors was to create non-conic optics. I wanted specifically to be able to have a really, really wide field of view uh, reflector set up that was going to be able to gather a lot of light. I wanted to look at it with my eye and I also wanted to try to hook it up to a camera. But based on this most recent series of attempts, I have pretty conclusively ruled out 3D printing as a technique that could create such an optic. The level of precision that you need to create actual image forming optics is insane. And I knew that when I started. I didn't really think that this was going to work. But there are still some things that I want to do with 3D printed mirrors in the future, and I was able to make a pretty cool saddle point mirror for Steve. Today we're going to talk about the fun trial and error that resulted in me arguably cheating in order to produce this mirror. Actually, this is the really crappy one. I already gave the good one to Steve. After my first video about 3D printed mirrors, the second most common comment was about the aging of the silver. I left completely exposed metallic silver surfaces, just exposed to air, and people were like, man, is that gonna tarnish? And the answer is yes. <laughs> After a while, they really do tarnish. This is one of the mirrors that I made, and about 20 seconds ago, I pulled it off of one of the racks over there. It's just been sitting in the garage because it looks cool, and it is, very yellowed and blackened around the edges in a really, I think, pretty way. Although it makes it not a very useful parabola anymore. Here are the benchies from that video and the play button. And you can see that they all got a perplexingly patchy patina that I think looks pretty cool. But you kind of have to know it's coming. I think the reason behind the patchiness is due to inconsistent mixing of the resin that I used underneath the metal layer. One of the mirrors I made more recently, I tried to cover up the backside of the silver with various spray paints, and the aging was almost instantaneous and different with each coating. So if you cover up the silver, you've got to use something that is designed to form a solid coating without reacting with the metal. Otherwise, it's gonna end up like this. The whole patina thing was the second most common comment that I received, but the first most common comment that I received by far was to ditch the two-part epoxy and use UV cure. During that first attempt, I really struggled with finding a mixture of resin that would cure properly and not react with the silvering solution. If the solution reacted with residue on the surface of the plastic that somehow wasn't fully cured, it would still make silver, but it wouldn't be smooth. So despite being metallic, it wouldn't actually be a mirror. For that reason, I ordered a couple options for UV cure resins, one polyester based and one acrylic based. The paper I was originally following had specified a UV cure acrylic resin, so that's the one I had highest hopes for. This stuff is pretty cool. Instead of mixing and waiting a few minutes for the material to thicken into a hard coating on the parts, these resins remain runny forever. You can heat them, cool them, and illuminate them with regular lights and nothing happens. But as soon as you hit them with a UV flashlight, they start to harden. It's pretty startling how fast this begins to work. This footage is in real time and you can see the surface of the blob here is already getting brittle. This may seem like a really niche market. Why would you ever need something to harden when exposed to ultraviolet light? But this is actually a foundational technology for just about all semiconductor device fab anywhere. 
I'm really reaching for B-reel footage here. Apparently, in grad school, I never took any pictures in the clean room, so these are from an uncomfortably long time ago in undergrad. But when you do this process called photolithography, you coat a sample with photosensitive resin, illuminate the film through a mask so certain parts of the pattern harden, and then you get to dissolve away the rest, leaving a pattern of plastic on top of your semiconductor that can be used to guide a second step. For example, selectively depositing metal so that it only sticks in the places where the plastic film has gaps. Using this technique, you can make some really unreasonably complicated structures, or in my case here, some not quite so complicated TLM test mesas. Today, I don't wanna selectively harden the resin. I actually wanna coat the entire mirror surface in a UV cure resin. And more than that, I want it to be really, really smooth. I want that resin to be as runny as possible so that surface tension actually, you know, fills in all the nooks and crannies and makes a nice smooth surface on top. And then you can shine light at the front surface and it will lock in the shape of the front surface of the mirror all at once. To make the resin runnier, I actually heat gunned it after it was on the part. This is something that would have been totally impossible with the AB coating that I was using in the last video because the heat would actually have accelerated the curing. With the ultraviolet cure resins, I can heat this up as much as I want and let it get super runny without any of it activating and hardening. These mirrors were designed in CAD by basically crossing two parabolas. And to minimize layer line effects and stringing on the printer, I printed them all at this wonky angle at a really small layer height. I was hopeful that this would give the runny resin plenty of surfaces to adhere to and produce surface tension. If each layer was very close, then the gaps between them would be small and easily bridged by the resin. If I printed the mirror flat, then there would be large steps of a full layer height, and the resin would need to stretch smoothly across much larger gaps. This process was kind of fiddly, but honestly a lot of fun to play with. I mounted the mirror blanks at an angle and spun them while I distributed the resin. And the hotter I got the part, the runnier and more even the resin became. If I got it spinning really fast, the centrifugal force even threw the resin to the edges like I was spin coating. Throwback to the photolithography. After allowing any excess resin to drip away and then wiping up what was left, I pointed an ultraviolet flashlight at the part and let it cure for a few minutes. This setup on the table was pretty hilarious. I had a single spinning disc surrounded by a heat gun, an ultraviolet light, a thermal camera to measure the temperature, and my regular camera because I was filming a video. It was very reminiscent of one of the vacuum chambers with a million ports that all converge onto a single point somewhere on the inside for an experiment. Throwback to grad school. These clips I've been showing you were using the acrylic based resin, but I did also try the polyester. Unfortunately, the surfaces that I got out of the polyester UV cure resin were super chunky compared to what I got from the acrylic. I don't know whether this was the specific brand that I happened to buy or whether this is a general property of the polyester resins. That one did actually come with a catalyst and I tried with and without. Neither mode seemed very smooth compared to the acrylic. Once I had a hard, smooth, cured surface, I did the same silvering process as before. The company that makes this stuff actually commented on my last video and confirmed that it's pretty much just the Tollens reaction, which takes silver nitrate through a series of convoluted equations, sticks the nitrate to a sodium, and leaves you with elemental silver. They also pointed out that I wasn't coating a glass mirror the way they intended, and that with plastics my results may vary. We'll get to that in a minute. The first time I tried this process again, it did not work. Well, crap. I want to blame tap water. The first time I mixed these up, I diluted the solutions with regular tap water that is unfortunately full of ions, and once I redid it, I used distilled. I say that I would like to blame the tap water because the alternative is that I put the part A solution in both of the spray bottles and there was no reaction actually happening. And considering that I didn't see a sludge of silver oxide in the basin when I was done, I fear that option two was more likely. I probably should not be let anywhere near a real chemistry lab. After a couple practice pieces to get back into the spray silvering, I had a great looking coating, but unfortunately it wasn't a great mirror. It was smooth like a mirror. It specularly reflected light, but it was not flat. If the shape I was going for was curved slightly, like swoosh, my mirror was more like bleh. A closer inspection shows that the striations I was seeing followed the layer lines of the print, 
and every handful of layers the surface quality changed. So when this was coated with silver, there'd be a few millimeters in a row, then another few millimeters pointing in an ever so slightly different direction, and then a few millimeters pointing in ever so slightly another direction, and so on. While the large scale shape may have been a perfect parabola, and the nanoscale shape was mirror smooth, the mid scale shape was giving me problems. Coincidentally, the same day after making these wobbly mirrors, I was watching a YouTube video about splines. And apparently, the rate change of the normal vector to the surface is crazy important to making good reflectors. Unfortunately, it's also something that's crazy difficult to make using an FDM printer, where the exact quality and characteristics of the print are liable to change over time. It's possible this was a cooling issue on the printer. Maybe the AC vent right above the printer was turning on and off every few layers. Maybe something in the slicer. Maybe the top of the part was going in and out of shade from the blinds on the window every few layers as the sun went overhead. I'm not sure, but I didn't think that I was going to be able to make a mirror this large at optical quality. Thankfully, I could cheat. Rather than trying to put acrylic resin onto a printed part, why not just use cast acrylic? It's already flat. Realizing that this was a good fallback, I'd actually already coated a piece of scrap acrylic with the silver solution, and it came out great. Cool thing about this acrylic sheet is that since it's clear and optically flat already on both sides, it's actually reflective both ways. The side coated with metal is a first surface mirror, where the light bounces directly off the metal and comes back. The uncoated side is a second surface mirror, where light passes through the front surface of the acrylic, bounces off of the metal acrylic interface, then exits at the acrylic air interface before coming back. In order to get the saddle point warp, I needed to bend the whole sheet evenly. Now, when I'm just holding a sheet of acrylic in my hands, it's super easy to press two of the corners forwards, two of the corners backwards, and then you get sort of a saddle point shape. So I decided to make a very crude stand that would do the same job. Sorry about this, but you did ask an American scientist, which means that this whole thing is proportioned in millimeters, and like the distance between the bolt holes is in millimeters, but the holes themselves are going to be filled with quarter 20 bolts. Good luck. Oh. Now, is there a way I can be more impatient about how I'm doing this? After some lasering, some cutting, and some tightening, I had a saddle point mirror. More than that, it was an adjustable saddle point mirror, which, despite the fact that I was cheating and not using the 3D printed shapes, I was extremely happy with. Although, if you remember the may not work on all plastics warning that the company that makes the sensitizer spray gave me, this stuff doesn't seem to like cast acrylic very much. This was one of my test mirrors, and literally just me picking it up to hold it in this video, I've gotten some silver to come off onto my hand, and I am not touching the back, because if I so much as brush this, I'm gonna pick the silver coating right off of it. When I took the good mirror to ThinkerCon to give to Steve, I had it in my carry-on luggage, all taped up around the edges and flipped upside down, so you were looking at the second surface mirror side with a piece of wood on top of that. So. Uh, it should have been very difficult to scrape up, and somehow I still managed to remove a good chunk of the silver before handing it to Steve. Hopefully he was able to get it home without too much additional damage, because it turned out to be much more fragile than I was expecting. And weirdly, much more fragile than the UV Cure acrylic resin mirrors. I mean, I can do that, and I'm not even leaving, I mean, I'm probably leaving a mark, but not much of a mark. I'm not walking away with more silver residue on my fingernail. And now for the official YouTube collab hook. I hope that you enjoyed watching the process necessary to make weirdly shaped mirrors like this, but if you want to see what something looks like through a saddle point mirror, you've got to go watch Steve's video. I did have a lot of fun playing with this mirror at home, and when I left it out for half hour on a table at ThinkerCon, there were a bunch of people walking by it that were like posing in front of it, trying to figure out exactly what it was doing to the image, so I'm sure that you're going to enjoy Steve's take. 
So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. And although it won't be next time, I uh, am not planning on this being the last 3D printed mirror to appear on this channel. I'm going to have some fun with them.